for King Herod Agrippa II, for his sister Bernice, for a great amount of military, uh, just uh, high-ranking officers, and just a bunch of people in, in prominent you know, places in the city. When the Apostle Paul had to walk through a temple in the city of Caesarea Philippi, and this is what the temple uh, probably looked like. And uh, if you go to this city called Caesarea Philippi, you still see the remains right on the sea. It was made by uh, just uh, Herod the Great, the grandfather of Herod, Herod Agrippa II, which was now standing there waiting for this small, probably sickly prisoner named Paul, waiting to hear his defense against some accusations that Jewish people, you know, just had given against him. And so imagine, you know, just all of the, the, the palace and, and its splendor and people dressed up in their fancy clothes and just, you know, waiting to hear this man named Paul. Now, why were they listening to him? Why did they, you know, why did he ha do that all of a sudden he had kings and, and just people in high positions listening to him? See, the thing about Paul is that something about his life didn't add up. He grew up a Pharisee, and all of a sudden, he turned his life around. They were expecting Paul to talk about his defense, why he should be set free from the chains that he was carrying. However, instead, Paul was going to be a witness of the message of Jesus and the resurrection to these people. And I believe that Paul, that same first century prisoner, wants to be a witness of Jesus and his resurrection to you and to me. Because there is power in, in our Jesus and me story. We're finishing a series called Jesus and Me. And what we're saying, our premise is that everybody needs a Jesus and me story. That you can't use the story of your grandparents or the story of your wife or your husband or a church story or a religious story. That everybody needs a Jesus and me story. And here's what I want you to know today. Here's the one thing that I want you to remember. Your lifestyle is both a result and a witness of your Jesus and me story. The way that you live your life is going to be both a result, is going to flow from your Jesus and me story, and also is going to be a witness of your Jesus and me story. Let me put it in a, in a different way. So if you can show the next graphic. I created a graphic. And if you ever watch uh, Back to the Future... You know, Doc Emmett Brown, that's kind of how I feel, okay? So there's a line right here. This is you, and this is you without Jesus, and you're going in any direction. By the way, this line could be going in any direction. It doesn't matter. But at some point, you will meet Jesus. At least I hope that's the case. For some of us, that's happened already. At some point, you were going in whatever direction your life was going, and you met Jesus somewhere, somehow. Maybe it was uh, your family that introduced you to Jesus. Maybe it was a church experience or a camp, or maybe it was a co-worker or someone introduced you to Jesus, and all of a sudden, you were faced, you know, face to face with Jesus, with the message of Jesus, the message of the cross and resurrection. And then when that happens, Jesus has a way of turning your life around. Jesus wants, you know, that to use your life for his purposes, and so he will turn it around, and he will create a different path, an alternate path to you. And then after that, you can say, that's Jesus and me now. So there was a, Jesus, a you before Jesus, then a Jesus and me experience, or maybe a set of experiences, and then a Jesus and me now. And so here's what I want to say. And believe me, I am, if, you, if you've known me, you know that I love apologetics, and you know that I love, you know, just talking about the, the, the reasonability of Scripture and Jesus' resurrection. But here's what I believe. The most compelling evidence that we may have that Jesus is alive it may actually be beyond the history books. And it may be in the hands of God's people. It may be in your hands and my hands. And anyone who calls themselves a disciple of Jesus, they probably will become at some point the most compelling evidence. The church is the most compelling evidence that Jesus is alive. Now the problem is that sometimes the church tends to worry too much about the things of this world, right? We get distracted 
with wealth, we get distracted with comfort, we get distracted with politics, we get distracted with whatever new philosophies are coming our way, and we, it's like you encounter Jesus, and you're, he's starting to turn your life around, and then it's like, well, maybe not. And our life doesn't become a result in a witness of Jesus story of our Jesus and, and, and me story. And so here's what we're going to do. Over chapter 26 of the book of Acts, by the way, if you, if you haven't downloaded your apps, uh, your Harvester app, I'm going to encourage you to download it. Uh, it's really easy, and you're going ha- you know, to be able to type some sermon notes today. And, and really, I want you to type a few things about yourself in the app over there today. So if you can and want to, you know, please feel free to do so now. However, for the rest of us, if you have your Bibles, if you don't want to use the app, uh, use your paper Bibles or your your devices, open them in Acts chapter 26. Now this chapter, we're not going to read the whole thing, we're going to read pieces of it, but uh, this whole chapter is basically about the graphic that we just saw, the Jesus and me graphic, where in part of it, Paul is going to talk about his life before Jesus, and then he's going to tell people how he met Jesus and then he's going to talk about his life after, you know, he, he's been walking with Jesus. And so we're going to get started there in chapter 26. It, remember, there's King Agrippa II, all of his court, and they're waiting for this prisoner walking through the hall. And all of a sudden, Paul finally gets there. And the governor, Festus, probably in his, you know, scarlet robe of governor, he says, Paul... You may speak. And at this point, Paul, if you started to read, he would say, I'm so glad that I get to be in front of you, King Agrippa, because you know all of what I'm going to talk about. You know the scriptures. You know the history of the Jewish people. And so I know that you will be able to understand exactly what I'm talking about. But then he starts to talk about his life in verse 4 before Jesus. And here's what he says. He says, the Jewish people... All know the way that I lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that I conform to the strictest sect of our religion, living as a Pharisee. And so Paul starts by simply saying and acknowledging, it's like, hey, I don't have to tell you who I was. Many people that are accusing me right now know exactly who I am. They know exactly how I used to be. And maybe for you, you know, you you need to understand that when it comes to Jesus, honesty is going to take you a long way. When it comes to the Lord Jesus, you know, religiousness is not going to take you anywhere. When it comes to the Lord Jesus, if you come trying to, you know, pat yourself on the back, that's not going to take you anywhere. When it comes to Jesus, if you are honest and come before him with honesty and before other people with honesty, then God is saying, okay, I think I can work in your life. Honesty is number one. And Paul says, listen, you all know me. I'm not making anything up. You know where I was. And then he keeps going. And this is not on your screen here. But I just want you to to listen to this. He said, hey, just like these people right here, I was too convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose this name, the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. Under the authority of the chief priests, I persecuted. You know, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time, I went from one synagogue to to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. And listen to this, this phrase. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. Here's the reality for most of us, if not all of us, every single human being. That before you get to meet the only one that can... Just really fill that void that we have in our souls. You will always, we we have this obsessive tendency to get attached to things or to philosophies or to anything else. And, And the Apostle Paul realizes like, I was obsessed with just hunting down people that follow Jesus. I was so obsessed. And and here's the question that I want to ask you. If you have your apps there, you're gonna have a space where it says, My Jesus and me story. And then it's going to say, me without Jesus. And so what I want you to do is ask yourself, if you haven't had, if you remember before you met Jesus and say, who was I before I met Jesus? We're going to focus on this section, me without Jesus. 
And I give you three spots there on the app that you can do. But you don't have to do it on the app. You can just think about it. You can write it down somewhere else. But just think, who was I before I met Jesus? Or who am I right now? You know, what are the things that obsess, like I'm obsessed with? You know, it can be that you're obsessed with, you know, like a lot of times it's like us, right? It's like super ego. It's like all about me. It's like whatever gives me comfort, whatever I want to do. It's all about whatever, you know, I'm number one. Maybe that's your obsession. Maybe, maybe it's someone else. Maybe it's a substance. Maybe it's, you know, just whatever, you know, emotional hurts or pains that you've had. Whatever it is that is causing you right now to be a, go a certain direction in your life. And I want you to just write, you know, who were you before you met Jesus? Just take, take a little time. And here is what, uh, what Paul says. I was persecuted in the way. I was persecuting all these people. I was obsessed with it. But then something happens. And we're going to move on to the next part. Verses 12. Here's what uh, the Apostle Paul says. 12 through 14. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, I was on the road and I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So Paul, all of a sudden, he says, this is who I was without Jesus, and now this is how I met Jesus. And, you know, for you, here's what I want you to do. I want you to, you know, right there in the app, you'll see the next section, which is, here's who you were before Jesus, and I hope you wrote two or three words. Maybe you can say, I was selfish. Maybe you can say, you know, I, you know, I struggle with this, or, you know, I struggle with that. And then, I want you to write on the next section, you'll see a section that says, I met Jesus for the first time on, then there's a, a line, and then at and, and here's the thing. The Apostle Paul remembers exactly. He says, I was on my way from Jerusalem to Damascus. And it was about noon. I mean, it was midday. And when I met Jesus, he came to me in a light that was brighter than the sun. So if you think about noon, when the sun is, you know, at, at its highest. And then you're thinking, man, this light where Jesus appeared to Paul was brighter than the sun. And it blinded him. In fact, we read somewhere else that he was blinded by that light. And then he heard Jesus say, why are you persecuting me? And he's telling just basically his story. Now, if you were King Agrippa and you were some of his high-ranking officers, and I'm Paul and I'm in chains and I'm talking to you about this Jesus, what is the first thing that comes to mind to you when someone tells you a supernatural experience? You're like, are you okay? Or like, are you sure it wasn't, you know, a coincidence? Are you sure, you know... Something wasn't wrong. It's like, were you, it's like today, right? Would you say, had you been drinking? Or were you a little bit, you know, on anything else? We, we tend to doubt it. And, you know, now, that's not bad at all. You know, like, hey, we should be cautious, right? It, people that believe anything and everything actually make me a little nervous. You know, it's like, you, you don't know, like, okay, so if I told you, you know, that I saw a pink elephant, you're going to say, yes, I believe you. Like, okay, so I don't know if I can trust you, right? So we should be cautious, don't get me wrong. And so how do we tell if this is from the Lord or not? Well, I'm going to tell you why they were intrigued. Because he was still in a story that matched his lifestyle. He's saying, the reason why I'm in chains today, I didn't want to. I was going a different direction. But then I met Jesus. And now... Because of him and his resurrection is that I find myself where you, standing in front of you, King Agrippa. Now, for you and me, it's going to look different. Praise the Lord, we don't have to be in chains to be Christians. At least not yet. You know, through history, we see that it's always a possibility in human history. But we all have a Jesus and me story. And if you, if, you have, if, you, if you have one, I want you to pinpoint it and say, you know, it was, you know, in my, in my room. I'll tell you mine. And I'm going to share a few things with you that I usually don't share about me uh, because this is not about me. This time that I have with you is not about me. But I feel like you need to know 
some things so that you can be like, maybe this is me as well. And maybe this is how the Lord is speaking to you. And, and I tell you, any single one of the things that I'm going to tell you about could be a coincidence any given day. But when you put them all together, then you're like, hmm, you know, it, what's going on? Is this, is this Jesus and God, you know, just working? And so, like, I'll just tell you the first experience that I remember about my Jesus and me experience happened I many of you know I grew up in Mexico City until I was 19 so I was just riding my bike on the busy streets of Mexico City and all of a sudden I don't know if it's a truck or or a car I remember literally feeling the the mirror grazing the back of my shoulder and you know what it was about that experience is that I felt like true like fear for the first time and I was like whoa, if I would have gotten hit, I didn't even remember like thinking or like seeing it coming. It's like all of a sudden, you just hear like the car was going so fast. I don't know what was going on, but he was going so fast. I just like felt that graze my shoulder a little bit and I stopped and I'm like, I would have been gone. I wouldn't even like noticed. And that's the first time that I asked myself the question, what if? I grew up in a Christian home. My dad was an agnostic. My mom was a Christian. But, uh, but I was like, is this true? Is Jesus true? And would I be, you know, and it was, again, it was selfish and it was self-centered. It was about heaven and hell, right? I was looking at salvation as a destination. It's like, where am I going? And I remember that night for the first time, I just got on the side of my bed. I was 15 at the time. And, and I said, Jesus, I know that, you know, I've been going to church, but I don't think that I've ever paid attention, too much attention. I want you to be if you are, you know, I actually said this word, if you are real, I want you to be in my life. I, I don't want to be fearing hell. You know, I, I don't know exactly how it all works. And, and I, believe me, I feel like I knew more than most people, but still at the time you don't know. And I just prayed for the first time with a sincere heart, with honesty, knowing, you know, that this, okay, I need to investigate if this is real or not. You know, and, and God kept working in my life. And I'll tell you another story that has, you know, again, some, sometimes the Jesus and me stories seem kind of shallow, but they help you strengthen your faith. You know, another story that kind of helped me strengthen my faith was just about a year later. I was about 16 at a time. I'd received Jesus at that point. I'd been baptized. I was reading my scripture. I was trying to change the way that I talked, you know, get rid of some few choice words that I didn't want anymore, that Jesus didn't want me to speak, you know, with, and I was struggling through that, but I remember, you know, one of the things that any teenager struggles with is identity, and I was like, where do I fit, and, you know, I always felt like my teeth were just all messed up, you know, and just kind of a mess, and I remember praying to Jesus and being like, oh, you know, I wish I could just, you know, take care of this, but I just pray, God, give me peace about this. And, like, I remember, like, two days later, I get a phone call from an aunt because my parents couldn't afford it at the time. So an aunt just called me and it's like, hey, they, they call me Gus, you know, they, hey, Gus, uh, I know that, you know, you've been having a lot of issues with your teeth and right now your family can't afford it and, you know, I just want to pay for braces for you. And that was, like, two days. And, again, coincidence, like, number one, coincidence, right? Number two, coincidence, a coincidental, could be. But let's keep going. Then the Lord called me into ministry, and I apply in 2002 to come and study here in the United States. Now, this is post-9-11, so all of the security, you know, just got, you know, had gotten an upgrade. And I'm here's, uh, you know, lower to middle class, you know, young man, single, you know, not really knowing much English, saying that he's going to come study in the United States. So guess what they told me at the embassy the first time that I went and applied? Like, sorry, like, we can't give you a visa because we feel like you're going to overstay it and work illegally in the United States. And I was like, okay, I get it. But then I was bummed, right? And I was like, okay, God, I feel you're calling me to go study and be in ministry, but you're going to have to provide. And a friend of mine told me, you need to pray about it and you need to try again. Just pray about it and try again. I remember praying. And I went, same questions, you know, and the same, almost the same answer, except that the lady just looked at me. And it's like God just let her know that I was telling the truth. And without really a, a real reason to give a single male, you know, lower, you know, middle income class, I, she's like, all right, Mr. Vega, have a good trip. Gave me the visa. Again, could be a coincidence, right? 
but you keep putting them together. Then I remember the, the following year, you know, I'm, in, I'm here studying. My, my parents get separated, you know, and I'm just like, I'm wanting to go back. And I just feel this, you know, this, this idea. I just, I've never heard Jesus audibly speak. But if, if I could, probably this is the closest one that's come. Just this piece is, you need to stay here. I'm going to take care of your mom. I'm going to take care of you. Don't go back. You know, and then I remember also one of the things that, you know, it was interesting just having, um, having $200 come into the States, and that was the only thing that I came with, right? And going to church and just tithing on that because I felt the Lord Jesus was telling me to do so. And I tell you what, I've never lacked anything because I trusted the Lord with that. One of the greatest things that I always, you know, like to tell people is it's a sock story. It's a story about my socks because, again, socks are not that expensive, but when you're a college student and you don't have, you know, a steady source of income, I remember buying socks the first time. I'm like, well, these are expensive. And I remember just praying, like, God, you know, help them last a little bit more than usual because I can't be buying, you know, this all the time. And I had other expenses. And what is interesting is, like, I remember praying that, never thought about it again. And all of a sudden, the first time that I got a paycheck Three pairs of socks just got holes in one week. It's like they lasted all through college, all through college, and then finally I got a job, and the first time, and, and it was so, like, it was like the Lord Jesus, like, remember that prayer years ago? I did listen to you. And then a day that I thought I was done in ministry, and that same day, another minister called me, actually, the, the, the guy that started LifePoint at the time, and said... God may discipline you, but he's not done with you yet. Or when we prayed, you know, I was praying for my wife to be comforted after a miscarriage, saying, God, I want you to comfort her and let her know that you are with us. And then we got pregnant with twins, right? The joke's on me, God said. The joke's on you. Or certain people that through the years, you know, I don't know if you realize this, but since I've been a campus pastor, we're like, we're like 92, I think, baptisms since 2016. And uh, yeah, praise the Lord. That's nothing but the Lord. But I can tell you, counted, you know, people that I've been praying for, and then we connect, and then they're like, I'm ready to be baptized. I'm ready to receive the Lord Jesus. And that's not me. All I'm saying is I'm getting to see Jesus through people, Jesus in me, and I'm just meeting them. And again, one is coincidence, and two and three, even this week, right, I had a guy that I've been praying for, and I hadn't seen him in a long time, and he messaged me. So again, how do we know that these experiences aren't just psychological, right? How do we know that Paul wasn't just having a, you know, an experience? Because his lifestyle didn't show it, you know, because I can p tell you any single one of these stories that I've experienced, and, you know, the many more that I didn't mention, but it, like... Okay, every single one of them could be just a coincidence. But put them all, putting them all together, and in, in, you add the knowledge of Scripture that we know how God works in people's lives, in the providence. You know, it's not only the miraculous, but the providential. And then you're like, you cannot convince me that Jesus is not working in people's lives today. And that's the Apostle Paul. He's telling them, hey, you can't believe me or you don't have to, and that's fine. But I'm telling you what I experienced. I'm telling you my Jesus and me story. So let's keep going. When we experience Jesus, and I hope that you've been able to write where you met him for the first time, that one time maybe that you remember, and where. Church, camp, your bedroom, outside in the woods, hunting, whatever it is that you were. But let's see. When you meet Jesus, here's what's going to happen, Okay. Meeting Jesus has two natural consequences. Number one, radical transformation. Number two, bold witnessing. If you meet Jesus, just like Paul, just like me, just like many of you, you know that Jesus is going to bring two natural consequences. One, he's going to ask you to radically be transformed. You know, he, he's like, I, I accept you as you are, but I love you too much to leave you the way that you are. So I'm going to have to mold you and transform you and change you the way that I think, the way that I created you to be. And that process starts immediately, and then there's bold witnessing. 
As we experience Jesus, he wants to shape us in order to use us. And so here's what verses 15 and 16 say. So, you know, when Jesus meets meets Paul, then Paul asks, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. The reason why Jesus is still working in our lives, many times through the Holy Spirit, is because he wants us to see him, and he wants us to see him in our lives. It's not just a one-time Jesus and me experience, as many, but then he wants us to, to serve him. He wants us to use him for his purposes and to share him. So we're going to serve him, and we're going to share him with others. And that's what the Apostle Paul was doing at that time. He was just simply sharing with them. And here's what he keeps going. He says... That the, the Lord Jesus told them, you know, I will rescue you from your own people. From the Gentiles, in verse 17 I'm reading, I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn, their, and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins in a place among those who are sanctified by faith. So we are sharing Jesus so that other people can experience him, so that other people can experience the forgiveness of sins. You know, I... I I sometimes forget, you know, the fear that I felt whenever I felt like I didn't have any hope or I would die without Jesus. And it's been so many years that it's hard for me to remember. And every so often I'll hear a testimony of someone else talking about that same hopeless feeling and that feeling of fear. And we got to remember, you may not remember it anymore. You got to remember there are people out there. You know, to us, it's easy. It's like if something happens, if I, what's the worst thing that could happen? That I die and go to heaven and be with the Lord? But what about the people that don't know him? They don't have the hope. They don't have the hope of change. And so then uh, here's what the Apostle Paul says. He says that he, in verse 19, he says, So then, King Agrippa, this is my response. He's like, the Apostle Paul is saying, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus and then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day, so, that I, so I stand here to testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. That the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. And, and this is what Paul says. He says he didn't go preaching in order to get Jesus' favor. He went preaching because he would experienced Jesus. So here's the other thing I want you to know. The radical transformation doesn't happen in order to meet Jesus. We are transformed because of Jesus. If you're coming to church and you think you're doing God a favor this morning, because it's like God wants me to go to church, right? At least that's what I think. And so I'm going to go to church to please him. Like you're getting it messed up. You're, you're backwards. It's like you come to church because you get to worship the creator of the universe. You get to worship your creator and your savior. It's not a chore. It's a blessing. It's a blessing to you and to me and to all of us. And if we are getting it wrong, then you're probably thinking that you need to be transformed in order to please God. But you can never be transformed on your own. I'm just going to tell you. If it's up to me, I will go to default mode, which is bad mode. Okay, that's default mode for Gus. And I assume, and the Bible tells me, that's default mode for everybody. It's like evil, bad, obsessions, you know, addictions. That's default mode for everybody. So if it's up to you, we won't be transformed. If we try to please God by transformation, we're not going to be able to do that. It is when you meet Jesus that you are transformed. It is through him, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we can be transformed. So that's what Paul says. Like, I just listened to the Lord. And he, still today, he said, God is helping me. He is using me and changing me. And so I want you to write, and this is the last part on your, you know, apps. What is... Your Jesus and me now testimony. How has he changed you? Now, there's many ways, right? And some of them are small, some of them seem big, and it doesn't matter because God is working in every single area of your life. 
But if we're having a hard time coming up with this, we need to ask ourselves again, you know, am I really letting God transform me? Or do I keep trying to avoid the cross? Am I trying to just go around that is like, yeah, I want to meet you, Jesus, but I don't want to do this. I don't want to give this up, you know, because that's close to your heart. Whatever the case is, I just want you to know this. When you let Jesus transform you, you're going to be able to share Jesus so naturally you don't even, like, can imagine it right now if you haven't. Jesus' transformative power is so strong, we can't help but share him with others. Jesus' transformative power is so strong, you can't help but share him with others. You know what happens when Paul starts talking about Jesus and the resurrection? The governor, Festus, stands up, and he slams his fist probably and says, Paul, you've gone crazy. You're out of your mind, Paul. All these books that you read in the Old Testament is making you, has made you go crazy. And to that, Paul replies like, you know, magnificent Festus, like, I am not mad. In fact, what I'm saying is very sane. You know, he had already said, why do we believe that God raising someone from the dead is so hard? If God can create everything, he's like, why is it so hard to believe that he would raise someone from the dead? You know, he has the power to do that. He's like, in fact, all that I'm saying, and this is why I'm so happy that I'm talking to King Agrippa, because he knows everything that I'm saying, and all the prophets talked about this already. God didn't do this in a corner in the dark. He said he did it in front of everybody. He's been telling us, and now Jesus has fulfilled everything. And so let's read verse 28 and 29 as we finish. He says, then King Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? You know that that's one of the most vague um, phrases that we have in the New Testament to translate. Because number one, Greek didn't have question marks. And so we don't know if that was a question or a statement. And also that short time, it just says, do you think that in this short time, it doesn't have time. So it could be time. It could be effort. It could be evidence. It could be any of those things. And so, so we don't exactly know if King Agrippa was being sarcastic or was being sincere. If he was asking a question or making a statement. And if he used the word Christian, uh, you know, the, in the beginning, the word Christian was used as, a, just as a, a term, you know, to put someone down. Like the word Christian means little Christ's. And so Christians were just little Christ, and so they would use that to make fun of followers of Jesus. So we don't know if he was using it as demeaning or if he was actually just meaning a one to be a little Christ. So it's such a vague phrase that it's hard for us to understand where he was. All we know is that he kind of wanted the way around. In that graphic, he wanted to go around the cross, right? He didn't want to commit completely. But here's what Paul says in verse 29. He says, Paul replied, short time or long, I pray that God, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. And he probably shook those chains, right? And said like, hey, I don't care who you are. I don't care if it's King Agrippa the second, or if it's, you know, the military high-ranking officers or the prominent people in the city. If you are poor and a servant and you're in this, in this uh, temple, in, in, in this uh, just place, what, I want you to accept Jesus. I want you to receive Jesus. He said, I saw the risen Jesus, and he changed the course of my life. So now I want everybody to do, experience the same thing. And though the resurrection is difficult to believe, and we should understand that, Paul was saying, that is the only explanation that I have to give you for this life change that I've experienced. See, when you experience the transformative power of Jesus in your life, you can't help but share him. Now, here's the, the thing. Imagine if... God's church became good about letting Jesus transform us and sharing him. You know, I tell you what, people are good at sharing already. Have you gotten all those Facebook forward messages that you don't want, that you keep clicking delete? It used to be emails, right? It's like spam. We call it spam. Now it's not emails. It's like Facebook forward anything or, you know, now, or even Instagram. 
So we are good at sharing. Don't get me wrong. People are naturally good. If you find a health recipe, like, hey, everybody needs to try this. Or a diet or a doctor is like, try this. He did wonders for me. Or if you find any deals, you're always telling, you know, so-and-so is like, hey, go to this place. They have a deal right now, right? Or politics. Oh, my goodness. Politics, right? It's like, hey, these are my views. This is why everybody should believe what I believe right now. You know, this is why, you know, the other side is, you know, it's the worst of the earth, right? We share. We're good at sharing. Even traffic. I even see people sharing things about traffic. Hey, don't go on this road because, you know, there's a, a traffic jam. I mean, the problem is not that we're not good at sharing. We're naturally good. But imagine if God's church concerned itself more with sharing Jesus instead of anything else. If before you share anything else, you had the lens of saying, how is this? Showing others my Jesus and me story. And what is this telling others about the Lord Jesus? Is this lifting him up? Or is this actually putting him down? Paul was there to defend himself. But he ends up sharing the gospel with kings, with military people, with the business people of this town. How about us? We need to meet Jesus, be transformed by Jesus. And share Jesus. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for uh, your son that wants to be in relationship with your people, Lord. I know that there may be many people in this room, Lord, that can share a, a Jesus and me story, Lord. We can maybe remember the first time that we encounter you. And I know also that there are people here that may not have yet a Jesus and me story. And Lord, for them, I pray that they would find you, that they would sincerely seek you. And your word tells us if we do that, we will find you. Because you're not far from us, from any of us. You're actually in our midst, Lord, and you want to be in relationship with us. And so I pray that, uh, Lord, that we humbly and sincerely continue to seek you. Lord, that uh, we, we come before you and with open hearts can simply say yes to you transforming us and changing us, Lord. We thank you so much. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.